Okay, we'll come back to intermediate writing or intermediate composition. Let's look at examples in the book, section 3.2, chapter 3.2. I gave two examples to give you a bunch of information. One was on language families and I asked you to do an outline, a uh, brief outline. Uh, and there are different ways of doing this. Uh, you could organize things by continent and you could do all of these, could maybe by continent or region or part of the world. Uh, or you could just focus on one. You could just focus on Europe and, uh, and then after, by, after continent, then do language families, big language families in Europe and subfamilies or branches like uh, Indo-European, all these Indo-European languages in Europe. Um, then you have like the, the Romance languages down here along the Mediterranean. You've got the Germanic languages up here and so on. You could do that. And then you could do the non-Indo-European languages. Like over here, there's Hungarian, there's these, what we call Uralic languages, Hungarian, Finnish, Estonian. Those are quite unique, quite different. Then you got this weird language called Basque and nobody knows what it's, it's spoken in Northern Spain. Nobody knows what it's related to. It's just by itself. So you could do language families. You could, you could um, organize the whole thing by starting with families, language families. Um, and you could just do like Indo-European and then Uralic and then the, the Sino-Tibetan families and so on. And then subgroups within those or language families and then region like continents. You can organize these by importance, um, starting with the number of speakers. These are the most like maybe these are the five biggest languages in the world in terms of number of speakers and their economic importance. Uh, and then the next five or 10 and so on. You could do something like that. Uh, there are different ways of doing this. Probably in this case, your purpose may be ex simply exposition, I'm not really arguing for anything, but just explaining things like an encyclopedia or Wikipedia article about languages of the world. Um, these would probably be more exposition, uh, unless you're saying, unless you're maybe looking at uh, languages by importance, by number of speakers and saying, well, looking for a foreign language to study here, the five most important ones in terms of number of speakers and their, maybe the economic importance of these countries and these languages. Uh, these might be your first choice to look at. You could also consider, you know, difficulty and such, well, these are harder. Uh, but most likely your point here would be just expo exposition or just explaining facts. Um, now let's look at the Znarf exercise, the religions of the Znarf. Uh, you might have chosen this. Let me give you some background on why I created this um, silly exercise and put it in here while I'm still using it. Years ago, it was about more than 20 years ago, I was uh, teaching ESL or English as a second language classes at a, my university back in the States. Uh, and I was teaching foreign students uh, writing and it was in a program where we had to follow a textbook. And <laughs> this is one of the reasons I don't like writing textbooks. Uh, the, the textbooks out there for teaching writing uh, skills are often, I think, not great. Uh, in this particular book, uh, well, we are doing like different paragraphs, like classification paragraphs, example paragraphs, kind of intermediate level writing stuff, intermediate, low intermediate stuff. And then we had this one exercise in the book about world religions. Here's some information about major religions of the world and uh, outline them, classify them um, uh, as if you were going to write a paragraph uh, to classify world, re world religions. And it gave inf some really basic information about various religions of the world. Uh, back then I was religious and I knew enough about my own religion to feel like this is not quite accurate. And I mean, these big religions, they're, they're kind of big and broad and different. Followers of a religion might have really different interpretations of really what their religion is and is about, even though they all say, oh, like we're Christians and there are different, really different kinds of Christians and different kinds of Muslims and so on. Uh, so I, I started to feel a bit uneasy and I uh, didn't feel like it really was accurate in its information about my own religion or other religions. And then I, one of my students who is from Saudi Arabia raised his hand and said, I, I don't feel like this is accurate. I don't, I don't like this. Um, this is not an accurate description of my religion. And I knew just enough about uh, other religions to say, yeah, I, I agree. I, I can see what you mean. 
let's forget this exercise and we'll come back next tomorrow and I'll we'll do something else. So that night I went home and I came up with this Znarf example, something that's not offensive because what a textbook says about your religion might not be consistent with your interpretation of your religion, uh, for example. So this was kind of one non-offensive and picking fictional religions, so I'm not going to offend anybody. And it's made a lot more useful as a writing exercise. So I created this Znarf uh, scenario and uh, weird religions just to be funny and kind of cute. Also a little more interesting for students than kind of really boring textbook statements about different religions. And if it's a statement about another religion you're not familiar with, it's not, not going to make sense to you. Oh, Hindus believe such and such. It may not make sense to you unless you've, I don't know, had some personal experience with Hindus or uh, uh, interacting with Hindu cultures, for example. So I thought this is better. So how would you go about this? Well, you can maybe uh, choose as your main organizational criteria maybe development in history. So you you would organize and outline that your, your first level of your outline uh, by development or history, and you can even kind of group some together. So the first one, the Taoism, that's your most primitive kind of religion, a very, very primi primitive religion. Then you've got these religions that have theistic or polytheistic elements, some kind of deities or divine beings, and there are several that would fit there. And then break that down further into this one and this religion and this religion, and each one of those gets a paragraph. Then you have religions that are maybe based on cultural symbols for or against certain cultural symbols uh, in, in this example. And then the last one, the more agnostic or rationalistic kind of uh, uh, non-religious or not very religious groups of people. That would be a logical way to do it. So your main level would be kind of maybe, you could just have each religion is a level. Uh, or you can kind of group them, primitive religions and then um, religions with uh, deities like gods or godlike beings and there are several there you can kind of each one of those could be a sub-level and then the those related to cultural symbols um, like Elvis or whatever then the agnostic ones uh, that would be a good way to do it and then the sub-levels could be like the different uh, particular religions in each category and then some of their major beliefs and how they contrast and differ. Um, you could classify this by different elements of the religion, like um, your first level could be like those who um, believe in like uh, ha um, primitive religious elements, like belief in supernatural elements of all of, of objects like rocks and such. Um, so their concept of the supernatural, then you can, so one little level of classification may be their concept of the supernatural and the different religions and their different beliefs on supernatural elements. And the next uh, level of your outline in your classification could be their um, practices. And another one could be maybe their moral teachings and so on. You could also classify your outline by region, by similarities and differences. For example, you could um, compare them based on their similarities with human religions, uh, for example. So uh, you could make this um, outline and the essay you would write from it. Uh, maybe your main point, your objective, your main objective in the essay might just be exposition, like an encyclopedia-like description of the religions of this planet, or, or it might have more of an interpretation, like um, Znarf religions show parallels with certain aspects of human religions and human religious development, and there maybe the basis of your outline could be uh, particular similarities. Um, you, you could again do the developmental historical primitive religions and then how they compare with primitive human religions and then those with 
deities and how they compare with human religions with deities, cultural, cultural symbol religions and how they compare with similar religions in human culture, and so on. So you can do your contrast comparison in a lot of different ways, for example, for some kind of interpretation, like how they compare with human religions and human religious development. And saying, oh, there's a similar pattern from primitive religions to deities to kind of more agnostic or rationalist belief systems, which are not quite religions. So different things you could do as an ARF. I'm mainly for these exercises, I'm mainly going to grade you based on your efforts, um, not necessarily accuracy because these are kind of open to your interpretation. 3.3, uh, uh, hopefully you looked at that, Windows versus Linux. What can you do with these if you were uh, writing based on this outline? Um, the first example, a uh, very simple comparison. Here's one operating system. Okay, then here's another, different aspects. Um, this might be for a very general purpose, um, like you're just seeing maybe individual computer users or those in a small company and to either say, argue for one over the other, this operating system would be best for your purposes, or to explain how to choose an operating system, like if you're just a typical home user, or if you're uh, um, starting a small company, you've got like 10 employees, what computer operating system would be best for your small company and your employees? Well, this, these are basically things you would consider, this is how you choose. Here's the pros and cons of Maybe Windows for your group, pros and cons of Linux for your group. Now the second example is more of a point by point uh, comparison and analysis. Um, and this is maybe um, more detailed, maybe for, for example, for talking about different groups and needs. Well, you're looking to buy computer systems, um, depending on your groups or needs, Linux or Windows might be better for you maybe different groups in a big company or different workers in different kinds of companies or groups of people who need computers for different purposes but they all need to have the same operating system so they can work together. So um, you can go point by point and talk about different needs uh, and the advantages and disadvantages of both operating systems for different groups and different needs. Uh, maybe Video, video editing people might benefit from this, people who have a lot of productivity to need to do this, people who need to do a lot of research analysis, different kinds of research analysis might want to use this one. Or if you have a big company and different work groups, well, maybe they can all just use Linux and you've got one work group doing video editing and they can use this type of Linux, which is good, better for video editing. And you've got this group of people who are doing a lot of data analysis and they can use this kind of Linux and this group of people are doing marketing and publicity and they can use this kind of more general purpose Linux and they're all using Linux so they can all work together and they can use different specialized Linuxes for different purposes. Those are things you can do. Um, so uh, we've seen that outlining, uh, well we've done a little bit of outlining uh, practice so that you can see how to do it, how to start an essay. I want you to maybe get some practice with outlining because it's a better way to organize your essays. And we've looked at a few examples and what you can do with outlining for contrast, comparison, classifying paragraphs, uh, for maybe organizing the data according to some kind of criteria to evaluate or to analyze things or to interpret things. Uh, to maybe make an argument for why maybe one idea is one approach, one system is better than another. Now in writing, uh, let's, I also want to talk about connectors. So we'll talk today about connectors in writing, particularly for these kinds of paragraphs, paragraphs of classification, contrast, comparison. Uh, these are things that maybe you are also know as transitionals or conjunctions. Some books call them discourse markers. Things like and, but, since, because, for, also, and, and such. Now I'll focus on the ones that are maybe re more relevant to classification paragraphs, contrast comparison, uh, and such. First of all, you may have been taught, oh, don't start a sentence with a conjunction. 
Have you ever been taught that? It's nonsense. It's wrong. Look at good writers, academic writers, professional writers, literature, literary writers. They start sentences with conjunctions. The problem is if you overdo it, though, and particularly if you use the same ones a lot. For example, uh, native speakers who maybe like in high school might overuse some common connectors. Uh, and likewise, people learning English as a second language, just due to a lack of familiarity with style and, uh, and vocabulary, might, and maybe with limited reading exposure, you haven't exposed yourself to a lot of reading, so you're not used to a lot of, a lot of variety of expression. Uh, so such students may tend to overuse certain connectors. And, for example, it's common to overuse and, especially at the beginning of a sentence. And actually, it is... Um, so when they say don't start sentences with conjunctions, the only time maybe it, it seems sort of right is this informal or professional writing starting a sentence with and really sounds informal. So starting a sentence with and, you see that in the Amy Tan essay that we looked at. It's really informal. In professional and academic writing, we don't start with and. You could leave it out, you can start with also, or additionally, in addition, and, and, and so on. Uh, students tend to overuse but and so. So instead of using but all the time, use more variety. Uh, and I'll give some examples, go through more examples. Instead of saying so all the time, use more variety. Thus, therefore, as a result, consequently. Now, getting back to but, uh, you can use though, although, however, and, and things like that. So, for example, Let's say Windows is popular and familiar, but it has its disadvantages. So that but is a very general purpose, uh, very general contrast. Uh, and it's not presenting a very strong contrast. It is true Windows is popular and familiar, but or on the hand, their hand contrary to expectation, but it has its limitations, its weaknesses. So that's kind of a minor contrast. Sometimes you could have a uh, a longer sentence, and the next sentence might start with but. That's okay as long as you don't do it too much. If you keep using a lot of uh, but, so, and in your essay, especially a lot of but and so at the beginning of sentences, it will sound too informal when you're trying to make a nice formal sounding essay. But you could have a long sentence, Windows is da 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 da, but it has its disadvantages because. You could do this. The, the fact that Windows is popular and familiar, that's kind of a, a fact that's familiar to a lot of people, to us. So you can kind of background it, emphasize it with something like although, or though. Uh, though Windows, Windows is popular and familiar, comma, it nonetheless has serious limitations and problems. So you can use though to kind of background information that maybe is either mentioned before or it's somewhat familiar, it doesn't really need to, you don't need to give it a lot of attention, you can kind of background it and put your, your main clause gets the real attention, it has its limitations and problems. You could use however for a stronger contrast. Windows is popular and familiar to most people. Stop. So you have a period uh, or a full stop before however. So, Windows is popular and familiar to a lot of people. Stop. However, comma, you have a comma after however. However, it has some serious limitations and drawbacks. So I'm using however to paint a, a stronger contrast. Now, you want an even stronger contrast use whereas, and this is really formal, and I, in recent years I've noticed Koreans overusing whereas. It's really for a very strong contrast. Uh, Windows is very expensive, whereas Linux is totally free. I'm making a strong contrast. Windows is very expensive and can uh, present, uh, the expense can present problems for a small business that's starting up, whereas, Windows, whereas Linux is totally free. It just requires a little more knowledge of computers to do. So I can make a stronger contrast. Some other expressions for maybe weaker contrast not a very strong contrast or something's completely opposite, but uh, things like in contrast, uh, in contrast, Linux is free. On the other hand, Linux is free. Uh, 
Conversely, so for example, my, uh, this for kind of two opposite situations, my boss did not ask follow-up questions, meaning that he accepted my ideas, or conversely, he was unimpressed with them. It's kind of like saying either he accepted my ideas or he was unimpressed with them. Okay, a few hints there. Uh, some other tips. Uh, I see Korean writers and other Asian writers making mistakes with certain expressions. Um, trying to use evidence as kind of a transition expression, it's like as evidence, and that doesn't really work in English. You can say, for example, or you could use a regular noun expression. Further evidence for this comes from uh, a study by such and such showing that. Da, da, da. Um, similar with support, uh, not as support. I, use, I occasionally see Korean and other Asian writers trying to use a uh, as support or some preposition or phrase with support like a sort of like as example or as a connector and it doesn't work like that in English. Uh, I, I know it works in Korean but um, evidence and support but not in English. You could say further support for this idea comes from da, da, da. or this study provides further support for such and such uh, noun or verb. Um, case like things like in my case in Korean kyungyue kyungyue nun, but that doesn't really translate into English except very colloquial or informal English. We say in um, uh, in the case of my I uh, proposal. Well, that sounds very very informal. You wouldn't really use it. Uh, in my proposal, we will do this. Um, so avoid overusing case in case in case of in formal writing. Uh, avoid overusing things like first, second, third, and by the way, you should know first, second, third, firstly, secondly, thirdly, those are different. First, second, third is American style. Firstly, secondly, thirdly is British. But So don't mix them up. But don't overuse these, and if it's a shorter essay, you don't really need these. You can just start sentences with other conjunctions or start them with the subject. Uh, if you keep going first, Da da da, second da da da, third da da da. It sounds kind of mechanical. You often don't need it. In English, we mainly use these if we're talking about something that's kind of hard to follow, something that's really abstract or really complex. Um, so unless you're doing that, then try to leave out things like first, second, third. It sounds a little too informal or mechanical. Now, more formally, you will see uh, certain abbreviations which are Latin abbreviations. So you may have seen IE, and this is Latin for that is, that is to say, in other words. Okay. So um, we are transitioning to a new open source system, IE, Linux. Okay. <clears throat> that is, that is to say. EG is, for example, and you see this in formal writing. Uh, we are looking at several versions of Linux, e.g. Mint Linux, uh, and so on. CF, occasionally you see this. Uh, this is Latin for compare, like Windows CF Linux compare. Uh, occasionally you see that in academic writing, CF. Uh, some things you should be aware of. You don't have to necessarily use these Latin abbreviations, but they are used in academic writing, sometimes professional writing especially IE and EG, so uh, know what those are. Okay, uh, so uh, we've talked about a few basic issues with connectors you should be aware of, and we've looked at some examples of uh, classification uh, for contrast and comparison to maybe present an argument, maybe just for exposition, but often to maybe present an idea to an argument by maybe using some kind of uh, criterion to evaluate, to classify things and then to evaluate things in order to say maybe this is the best um, operating system for your group or this might be the best one uh, or these are things you would want to look at or this is the best way of standing up to oppression and fighting discrimination. So we've seen those examples today. So. Uh, we're about to go on a holiday here in Korea, so enjoy your holiday, and I'll post maybe a Google Form assignment due by the end of the holiday break, 
related to the next topic, which will be process paragraphs and things like that. So enjoy your holiday, enjoy your homework, and I will see you later. Goodbye.